Thank you very much uh, to come despite the fire, uh, the dangers uh, in the wilderness. And uh, I'm very happy to be back in Berkeley, in particular, not only because I see old friends uh, and new friends, but also because uh, Dick, uh, our, uh, Dick Karp, our old uh, and beloved professor, is here. So, Algorand. Let me tell you, I'm giving this talk, but uh, this project now, uh, at least in some uh, uh, temporal order, has received uh, a lot of um, help from a wonderful team. And uh, Jing is here, uh, uh, the chief scientist of Algorand. And, um, and so, so at this point, when uh, you, you see all kinds of, um, lots of names that are, they are really behind it, so you realize that the project has evolved. But I find out of it uh, to speak about uh, at the high level in the original, uh, in the original vision, things are a little bit you know, easier to understand. So I'm going to give you a very high level description of what uh, our algorithm works and what the problem is it will try to solve, okay? I'm not going to give you the latest and greatest, but I, I can hint about some new things that we are doing. I don't think. All right, so by the way, Everybody knows what a blockchain is, presumably yes, but I'm going to say it anyway. So it is a decentralized database, right? That is, uh, you must satisfy three properties. That is, uh, uh, is uh, readable by anyone. Anybody can write an entry in this database and somehow nobody can alter the database. So this, uh, the data is, uh, appears in block. Think of what is inside the block, some transactions. Think of it payments for as a simple kind of a transaction. And these blocks are chained because nobody should be able to alter the content of the block nor the order of the block, okay? But everybody should be able to, to see them. And uh, it's not a database that I keep in, uh, in secret and you ask me question, I tell you what the content of the database is. Everybody should have a, a copy of this database you know, uh, on your own uh, laptops, okay? Everybody reads, everybody can write, and uh, nobody can change it. All right. So what is good to such a structure? Turns out that it's good for a lot of things. One of things is cryptocurrencies, because you start with a bunch of, of money that uh, initially um, you, uh, you declare who has what this money, and then you start making payments to other people. And then more people, um, you keep track in these blocks about who owns how much money. And so any time that you make a payment is clear, the payment is valid, and uh, so on and so forth. That is one typical application. Already there are already 2,900 competitors, blockchains, uh, and cryptocurrencies. So you must have uh, some, uh, uh, some enthusiasm to, to enter into this arena. It's a wonderful application, and we are... But another one is, in my opinion, more fundamental to, uh, to us as a society is really decentralization. Disintermediation, rather, I want to say. That we are, somehow we can transact without having a guarantor of a transaction. Of a transaction. But uh, we are going to discuss it a little bit later, and that is actually one application which is really, I think, is uh, fundamental. You know, when, it has been said that it does so many things that even cures the common cold. Here is a guy, very sad, he has a cold. I sympathize with him. He goes to the blockchain. And as you know, anything is better on the blockchain, right? So, okay. <laughs> All right. So the blockchain prom promise is uh, immense because who does not like a database that uh, is inalterable? Who does not like you know, transparency? Who does not like the ability to generate trust between people who barely know each other? The applications are essentially unlimited. However, there is a constant challenge here in this blockchain, and that is the tension between aspiration and technology. And so somehow, there have been a very big gap between what blockchains are defined as structurally as this database, which is readable by everybody, writable by everybody, and inalterable, Somehow, what you can do and what actually technology backs up all these claims is a little bit you know, much tougher. However, having very high aspirations is our duty as humans. Eventually, however, we should sustain our aspirations with some technology, otherwise they remain a pie in the sky. Excellent, looks very good, but we cannot have it. And so, don't take my word, but um, um, 
there is the famous uh, trilemma enunciated by uh, Buterin, the, one of the founders of Ethereum. He's a, a very famous uh, uh, blockchain. And essentially, the trilemma says that uh, in a blockchain, you cannot have all these three properties. Security, uh, decentralization, and scalability. Just imagine if this were true. Let me tell you that uh, there are no good options over here. So just imagine I set up um, a company which is a blockchain by design, and uh, you come to me and you say, I need a blockchain. That's very good. So, but you know the trilemma. So you want an insecure blockchain? You know, well, maybe not. You want a blockchain which is not scalable? Well, what, what do you plan to do to, uh, to play with uh, friends and family? Or you don't want to have a blockchain which is decentralizable, de decentralized. And so essentially, there are no good options, right? It's like if I tell you, do you prefer that I shoot you in the left knee or in the right knee? So I say, well, <laughs> given the choice, I don't have to avoid it. So the trilemma, if it were true, is really not acceptable. We should all pack up and go home. But fortunately, this falls, right? So it, is, um, it has been for many, many, many months true for uh, thousands uh, of, uh, of blockchain, but doesn't mean that these three properties cannot be achieved uh, all at once. Can I ask you a question? So this trilemma that was stated by so for Ethereum, what does he say they don't have? Ah, then, uh, the, 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 uh, scalability. So the, the complaint was, uh, as the, the story goes, uh, but it can be myth, so I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm telling things that I didn't uh, witness personally. I to say, well, the blockchain is not you know, fast, is in, fast enough. He says, what do you want? So, so you cannot have all three, so we better sacrifice some. But let me tell you that what I, I actually believe that the usual victim, the truth is that the usual victim is a decentralization. Because when an insecure blockchain, you cannot sell it to anybody, right? So who wants it? So um, if you want to have something which is uh, not scalable, well, essentially, you are not in business because you need to scale otherwise to, uh, to be profitable. Or to, to... So who, what are you going to sacrifice? Is really decentralization, which should be at the essence of a blockchain. And, um, and, and so let me tell you why do we need to sacrifice? Because there is a problem here to solve. And the problem, what is it? In a chain, in a blockchain, there are two aspects. One aspect, if you're not a cryptographer, sounds tremendously difficult to guarantee the inalterability of a database. That is easy. That is uh, done by prehistoric cryptography. Define prehistoric cryptography. Before Shafi and I got into the scene. So, it's, <laughs> so, so the, the one-way hash function, right? So you take a block, you hash it, one-way hash it, and you make this entry part of the next block. And believe it or not, I'm not going to talk about this uh, here today, this guarantees that the chain cannot be altered, not, not in the content of the blocks, not in the order of the blocks. But you know, because people want to write and they try to push a transaction into the blockchain, somebody must to append a new block or new transaction of the chain. The chain must grow. So what is the problem? Who chooses the next block? That's the whole problem. Now, that doesn't seem to be a mathematical problem. But, well, it's not a mathematical problem. It can be easily solvable if I say, if you don't mind, I choose the block, the next block. Right? But that is a tremendous power. Because remember, in a blockchain is really the ground truth. So the transactions that are happen are the ones posted in the block because the entire world sees what has happened. It's common knowledge. So if I have the power to choose the next block in a blockchain, I have more power than uh, Louis XIV, the quintessential uh, absolute monarch, right, on, uh, used to have. Because I decide these are the transactions that have happened in the world, and these are the transactions I don't want, them, they never happen. That is, that's where power is. Who chooses the next block? And that is somehow theoretical computer science, mathematics, have to solve this problem which is not exactly the usual problem, right, you know, that you, you meet you know, in uh, math books. So let me tell you why this is a problem. OK, let's assume we are at the beginning of a blockchain. There are block one, block two. And the question is, what is going to be block three? And so let's assume that we have here these uh, five uh, people. 
the black, the green, the red, the purple, and the orange, multiply it by a billion, and you have, you know, planet Earth, humans, okay? And then these people, what do they do? They transact. So if you multiply it by a billion, that's like an accurate picture of the possible users. And here is another, these people want to transact. These are payments, sim very simple pay case of a transaction. And so any time that I want to make a payment, right, from me to Shafi, from my public key, I digitally sign and send a payment to Shafi, I push in the network and disseminate these payments, which are start getting propagated over the network. So what really happens is not this picture, but this, all these payments, they go around the other way. And they generate a full of dust in which you know, nobody sees anything anymore. Let's have the dust settle because I have the power of a laptop, otherwise it's continually going and you never know what happens. And let's have a snapshot. So let's assume what is the current vision of the green. In e he has seen payment number P1, P2, and P99. So in his mind, his block is con con the next block, block of B3, consists of these blocks and the hash of the previous block. The black player sees P1, P5, P99, and so in his, in his mind, the block is that plus the hash of the previous block. Now notice one thing, that uh, P1 has been seen by the green and also by the black, and so has P99. But uh, P3 has been seen by the green, but not by the black player. And that is the, the case, because messages over the network, they go at the speed of light through routers and things, that's very nice, but they don't propagate instantaneously. So a message, when they float, they come first to me and then to you, or first to you and then to me. So it is my, my block in my mind is this, your block is this, there will be a big overlap, but there is also going to be a delta, a difference between these two sets, right? So something that you see and I don't, and vice versa. Therefore, my block and your block don't coincide. And so then the question really is, which of these two blocks, the green or the black or the orange or the thing, there are five billion people, five billion opinions of what the next block is, which of these blocks should we add to the blockchain? By the way, it doesn't matter so far, so far the block contains a valid transaction, if we add the green block, the black block, because they're all good, right? Pretty soon uh, we'll get all transactions. But, you know, but, but we have to decide which one. Okay, let me tell you, how this uh, problem has been uh, approached in the past. And uh, here is uh, the, uh, the first approach was a proof of work, which was uh, the invention of, of Mr. or Mrs. Nakamoto, or the Nakamotos, we don't know how many there are. And uh, it was the first idea and it was a, a brilliant idea. However, you know, it needs some improvements. Here is why, what is the idea? The idea is the following, listen, I don't want to say that you should uh, be in charge of doing the, uh, the next block or fun fun the next block. So who is going to do it? We'll have a, a computational game. There is a cryptographic riddle. The first one to solve a riddle has the right to attach his or her block to the blockchain. Okay, ready, go. People try to solve a computational riddle by, think of it like, plugging random values to a very strange equations until the, the equation is satisfied. You, you get it zero, right? When you, when you do, you say, hey, here is my solution to the riddle, and here's my block. And, but you want also that this riddle is so hard that at any point in time, no many or many people try to find the riddle, solve the riddle, you have one solution every 10 minutes. Why? Because you want to prevent that you have two solutions a few seconds of each other. Because if you have two solutions of a second of each other, then the chain, rather than being a chain, he has a fork. Because you say, well, that's a possible continuation, is a block with a good solution to the riddle, that's another block of a good solution to the riddle, and uh, which branches of the chain is. And when this happens, eventually one of the branches dies, and, but you don't know exactly what, what, where the chain is, right? So that is the problem. By distanciating, making the riddle so hard that you have a solution every 10, 10 minutes, you make it very improbable that there is going to be two solutions a few seconds of each other. 
But if you decide that you want to produce blocks faster, every minute rather than in 10 minutes, if your riddle is easier, because now it takes one minute, then the probability that two solutions of few seconds of each other may arise goes exponentially high up. And so then you have an exponential growth of forks, and that's very hard to even to distinguish in this big spaghetti mess where the longest chain is. Okay, is this clear? So that is a great idea, which has a democratic uh, uh, ring to it. Anybody could do it. And uh, which person actually does it, which user does it, is uh, the first who wins the game, or the computational game. But what is the drawback? A is low, and B is expensive. Because, in fact, I don't know if you, if you Google miner, this way, nobody thinks about mining the old fashioned. If you're a miner, you get you know, a Bitcoin miner, okay? Which you find the racks and racks and racks and racks of specialized hardware. That's the only way in which you have actually a chance to, to make money by mining in, in, in Bitcoin. Very expensive. And when things get very expensive, so first of all, expensive and slow is a hard sale. Expensive and fast, I can understand, but expensive and slow is hard to sell. So, but independent of this, when something becomes very expensive, what happens? That fewer and fewer and fewer people can afford the expense. So whatever wanted to be a decentralized system, de facto becomes centralized. So much so that the Bitcoin um, uh, blockchain is controlled by three mining pools. Is this decentralized? Not according to me. Certainly one is even worse, right? but two is bad and three also. Okay, never mind, expensive, fast, centralized, let's move on. Delegated proof of stake, that is a very simple idea, very low tech. And uh, he says, well, look at these 21 people. Don't they look honest? Yes, they do. And don't you think like me that they will continue to be honest in the foreseeable future? Yes. Why don't we put them in charge of selecting the, the next block on behalf of all of us for uh, the next uh, month or, or something of, of year? Okay, so is this decentralized? No, but it's even worse than Bitcoin because a Bitcoin somehow tried to be decentralized and somehow as a side product of expenses and things got centralized. This approach starts being centralized from the get-go. Right? Okay, next, bonded proof of stake. What does this mean? Okay, oh, in bonded proof of stake, ah, we are not like a delegated, delegated pufui. Bonded, good, what does it mean? That bonded, we allow not 20 people, but 20, 200, 2,000, as many as they want people, to put, push a, a lot of money in the middle of the table, where they cannot touch it anymore, and the people who push the money in the middle of the table are the ones who generate the next block on behalf of all of us. And their influence in generating the block, the next block, is proportional to the money that they put in the middle of the table. And if they misbehave, their money gets confiscated. Wow, that nails it, right? Well, let me ask a different question, perhaps a simpler question. How much of your disposable income can you afford to put in the middle of a table hostage? And my suspicion is going to be very little. So in a system like this, you make it easy for rich thieves with deep pockets to put a lot of disproportionate amount of money in the middle of a table for the sole purpose of controlling the blockchain. And then you say, but so what? If they misbehave, their money gets confiscated. Well, not so fast. There is a lot of bad things that you can do without triggering any confiscation of your money. So for instance, uh, think about an, um, in an auction, which in a, uh, do you want to use a blockchain for doing an auction? Of course, because you have a transparency. Right? Everybody can see the bids. Everybody can see who the winner is. It's, blockchains are great, but assume the blockchain is uh, <laughs> controlled by the, the three guys. So I can actually tell them, if you're selling your building, I put my bid, don't put any bid above mine, the end. Oh, confiscate Shafi's money because oh, no, she didn't put my bid. Shafi can say with total deniability, which bid? I didn't see it. 
Right? So it's not so easy, obviously. So let me, there are uh, all kinds of approaches, but you know, there is a common flow in my opinion, so that is a, is a subjective statement here, that uh, is common to all these other approaches, that somehow the whole economy works if and only if the majority of a small corner of economy are honest. Okay, who are the small corner, of, the members of the small corner of the economy in proof of work? The miners. Okay, I don't know if there are economists over here, but in the global GDP, what fraction of the global GDP is represented by the miners? You need not a magnifying glass, not a microscope, but perhaps an electronic microscope, because it's just a speck in this thing. So to make sure that you take the global economy and you put it in the hands of uh, this few, I think is a recipe for disaster. So, okay, so then, so at Algorand we decided we ought to have to start from scratch, because sometimes it's better to start from scratch than to patch up things. Not all the time, but sometimes. And so we started from scratch. And uh, what approach do we use? We use a pure proof of stake. Not delegated, not bonded, pure. What does that mean? That means that the money is never hostage. And where is the money if it's not on the table hostage? Well, it's where it should be, in your wallet, in your fingertips, ready to be spent, or invested in the various financial opportunities that the blockchain offers you. Wherever this money is going to be, in your hands, invested, or anything else, you ask yourself a question. Is the majority of the money in honest hands? If yes, the system cannot be compromised. Put in another way, who can sink a pure proof of stake system? The owners of the majority of the money that they decided to collude with each other and shoot themselves in the foot to destroy the very economy of which they own the majority of. In my opinion, that is a preferable approach because it's less likely this, this to happen, okay? Okay. So that is a, at a high level conceptually what the approach is. And very, at a at high level, what are we going to do? At Algorand, we, how do we choose the next block? Believe it or not, for somebody who, who knows this is not uh, at high level, we agree on every single block. And the agreement uh, is actually so-called the Byzantine agreement, which is a very strong notion invented by Peace, Shostak and Lampert. And don't confuse it with an adjective Byzantine agreement, because sometimes when you put an adjective, Byzantine agreement changes meaning completely and is not as strong as notion as is written here. What is a Byzantine agreement? It's a communication protocol. The people in this room start talking to each other. Each one of us starts with one value in our heads. We have a majority of honest people in the room, that's the assumption. You can see who is dishonest over there. We have a single value and we talk, talk and talk. At the end of our conversation, Two properties are guaranteed. The first property is called agreement. All the people who adhered to the communication protocol, to the letter, they have output to the same value. They have the same value in their, in their head. That's property number one. Is the value here a block? Pardon? Is the value here a name of a block? Yes, but I will disclose this later, a little bit of suspense. Whatever the value is, we start with some values, we talk, talk, and talk. All the people who honestly follow the protocol think the same value. You know, that is easy. You know what is hard? Why it is easy? Because here is a protocol that does it right away. No matter what your value, initial value is, agree on zero. Yes, ma'am. All the honest people who follow the protocol agree on zero. But this is not meaningful. And that's why you need the consistency property. The consistency property says that just in case everybody started with the same value, say 27, then not only all the honest people should agree on, the co on a common value, but they should agree on the very value they started with. In other words, they should agree on 27, not on zero or one or anything else. Is this clear? This is a pretty good protocol. 
It's very, when you look at this uh, protocol, you start saying, you know, this should be easy to produce a protocol that has these two guarantees. Uh, my suggestion is try and then look it after your solution the day later and uh, at least for one or two times there is going to be an error somewhere, right? Okay. So, if we have this Byzantine agreement, what are these values? These values are what we said before. I have an image in my mind of what the next block has to be. You have another image. At the end, we want to agree on a common block, uh, on one block, right? We want to agree on the block. So, okay, great. But if these uh, three people design such uh, protocols, and uh, ever since the original design, there were other uh, problems, why don't we plug in from the literature, dig out a Byzantine agreement protocol, plug it in, and you agree on the block. We're done. We have a new blockchain. Not so fast. Why? Because a Byzantine agreement is very slow, defined slow. In any practical application, there were 12 participants in the protocol. 12 in a blockchain which wants to handle the entire world? Uh, no. There are billions of people. And the second assumption is that you know that the player set of the Byzantine agreement is fixed and known in advance. Well, if this were true, certainly doesn't apply to a blockchain in which a permissionless blockchain in which users can come and go and nobody knows at every single point in time who the users are, right? So that there are some challenges. Nonetheless, part of, uh, of the Algorand protocol is really give a, a new consensus mechanism that actually is really super fast and delivers Byzantine agreement on the nose. So we will be able to agree on, on the next block very fast. Okay. All right. If you get this part, we are making progress. We agree on a block. And we agree because there is an honest majority. Right? Majority of the money is in honest hands. We are making progress. Let me tell you right away some consequences of this way you're doing things. So here is Algorand in action. By the way, I told you that uh, agreeing on the next block is hard. But there is one block in which we don't need to agree, and that is the genesis block, block number one, because that is part of a very protocol. When you define a blockchain, you decide what is in block number one. Next to block number one, you have a favor. I believe an universal symbol of lightness and effortlessness, right? And so what happens is that as this uh, favor gently falls to the ground, the Algon blockchain unfolds. Okay, so you can say, wait a second, Silvio, what happens to proof of work? What happens to forks? You show us a linear chain. Well, guess what? There, are, there is no proof of work in, uh, in, uh, in Algon. Why? Because we don't have to solve riddles. We have to agree on the block. If the agreement is really fast, we are done. And there is no forks. Why? Well, because <laughs> once we all agree on a single block, the majority of us agrees on a single block. There is not a second block on which the majority of us agrees in addition. So that's why it does not fork. And even these two properties have some advantages. One is that you make easy to people to participate. You don't need to buy expensive uh, hardware to participate to the consensus, uh, to the generation of the next block in Algorand. That is no proof of work. And uh, forks means no transaction finality. So a very uh, transaction finality, rather. Why? Because if you get paid in a block, do you ship the goods if you are buy somebody is buying your goods? Not really. So, well, I'd like to ship you the goods. But you know, if there is a fork, and your payments end here, and then this payment, uh, this, this branch of the blockchain disappears, and my payment are not going to pay. So why don't we wait a little bit? Okay, how much you want to wait? Well, 10 blocks. 10 minutes a block by 10 blocks is more than an hour. But you know, at some point in time, right, it, it, gets, you know, it, it gets much longer than people think. So to have instead that you are actually paid, the moment in which a payment made to you appear on the blockchain is a big advantage in finance and all kinds of other transactions. All right. So let me summarize what uh, uh, the Algon properties are. 
Again, the main assumption is the owner's majority of money, and the technical advantages are the first one, the computation is trivial. There are no riddles, so a few addition, a comparison, a digital signature, a verification of a signature, nothing to write home about. The second one is a true decentralization. Each token participates with the same power. So if you have 10 billion tokens out there, each token, the owner of one token, there are no privileged tokens. Each token has the same power as any other token. And then uh, there is a, prima a finality of payments. Why? Because the Algon blockchain doesn't fork. Actually, I lied. What's a token then? Oh, a token. A token is, uh, you know that in cryptocurrency, you have uh, whatever I call that, coins, a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's a token? That's a, it's called a token. Okay. Sorry, guys. I somehow blockchain language, right? So it turns out that whatever I described with the linear chain is a, is a white lie. Why? Because the probability of forking algorithm exists, but it's very small is 10 to the minus 18, okay? You say 10 to the minus 18 looks a very strange number. Of course it's strange, because I made it up. But let me tell you why I chose it. Because 10 to the power 18, we have a theoretical physicist, Jonathan, with us, can confirm is the number of seconds from the Big Bang until now. So another way to say it is that if you produce a block a second, which is a very good clip, yes, there may be a fork in algorithm, but once in the lifetime of the universe. So I'm afraid to confess that I don't think I have any hope to see a fork. <laughs> and I, I wish you, you will, but you know, it's uh, somewhat improbable, okay? Okay, so then scalability, you can generate blocks as fast as you can be propagated provided this Byzantine agreement is really fast. And security, against a bad adversary, how bad? Very bad. So in other words, this adversary, so algorithm is secure, even if there is an adversary who, has a, who can immediately corrupt a lot of players, and they can coordinate them in addition to it, and, on, and not only can attack the protocol, but also the communication network of which the protocol is run. And by the way, I believe uh, it is very good to be very prudent here in blockchain because if you have a really a blockchain should be able to, that works, should be able to secure the trillions of dollars in assets. And the thieves are like mushrooms. After the rain, they spring up. If there is a trillion dollars opportunity, you'd be surprised how many type of attacks to the network, to the protocol of can rise. So we must be prepared. Okay. So now I want to give a little bit of, uh, of a taste of how really, how does the Byzantine agreement gets, gets into the picture? Wh what do we do? How does Algorand work? Algorand works in two magic phases, where magic is actually replaced by mathematics. But as everybody knows, magic is a bit easier to comprehend than mathematics. So let's stick to magic today. So two phases. What happens in phase one, the proposal phase? By magic, a token out of all the coins in circulation is selected. This token must belong to somebody. This somebody proposes a block. End of phase one. Wasn't this easy? Good. Phase two. By magic, a thousand tokens are randomly selected among all the tokens in circulation. They must belong to somebody, and this somebody are the player or a Byzantine agreement to agree on the block proposed by the first person. <coughs> okay? Says, so, why do we need a second phase? Because in any society, and a blockchain is no exception, there is going to be a percentage of bad actors, criminals. Let's say, how many? One percent maybe 2%. If you live in a very dangerous society, 10%. I want to ruin myself, 20%, okay? But at some point in time, in no society, there is a majority of criminal, because by definition, a society is <laughs> something, the majority whose member follows some rules, okay? Whatever uh, the society is about. So, let's assume we live in a very dangerous society. 10% of us are criminal. You should not leave the house without a rifle or a hand grenade or things like this. Okay, body armor, 
bodyguards. And, uh, all right, and uh, if 10% of us are criminal, you know, select a token at random, 10% of the time belongs to a criminal. And what's what a criminal can do? He cannot steal your money, but he can tell you the block is X, me the block is Y, Shaf the block is Z, thereby creating discord about, in, we don't have a chain anymore, we have something totally undefined. So in, that's why in the second phase where there is this agreement, because just in case this guy says different things to different people, you want to collapse them into a single block. But remember that uh, the phase, second phase works if the majority of the members are honest. Now we have to do a little bit of envelope computation, right? To say, if 90% of the people are honest and you take a thousand of them at random, what are the chances that you get a thousand people at random with a dishonest majority, very small. You get back into this, uh, that's a very minuscule quantity, right? That's the idea. So, so the second phase essentially decides whether the first phase was honest. Well, you don't even need to, to decide because it's actually inessential. So the, remember that, you know, uh, you may end up agreeing on the same block. I'm assuming that I'm bad. I tell you block is X, Jing the block is Y, Jonathan, the block is Z, et cetera. And at the end of the conversation, because you don't know if I am doing this or not, only you know that you have a starting value of X, at the end, we, you talk, 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 and we agree on, on the same thing. It could be the same X. So for your point of view, say, oh, Silvio was honest. But from Jinky's point of view, say, ah, because I told the, he told me why, and then we are agreeing at the end of X. Nonetheless, she will agree if she's honest, like you, on, on X, okay? So not, not, but it's not necessary to know, uh, to decide if it was honest or not. The important thing for us is to have a new block with the certainty that everybody else who is honest sees the same block, okay? That's, that's, that's the idea. All right. So you see that phase two is important because that is where with high probability, you know that there is going to be a high majority. And because you are randomly selecting these uh, tokens or think about randomly selecting people, which is a bit easier to think about. Let me do a sanity check. Say, okay, Silvio, the way I understood it, the way you're describing Algorand is that what counts, what makes the system work, is that you randomly select people so that, you know, if there is an honest majority, you have a, 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 a committee with a, um, an honest majority. But who selects these committee members, if I may ask? Well, just assume for a second that I say, if you don't mind, I do. Many says you are centralized, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So in Algorand, there is a little bit uh, uh, kind of an, an, orthodox, an orthodox idea to say these committee members randomly select themselves. So say, gee, this sounds a bad idea. Actually, in fact, it sounds a terrible idea. Even more, when it's one of the worst ideas, I don't say, because if you put in charge a committee to get uh, things to work, and you allow this committee member to be self-randomly selected, I randomly selected myself for this committee, thank you very much, and for the next block, I am also randomly selected myself, oh, I got selected as myself, right? And so on and so forth, because you really want to have as much control as possible. But not so fast, because what does it mean that you select yourself? That as soon as you see the previous block appear, you ask yourself, am I a member of the committee to approve the next block? And to solve these questions, you run in the privacy of your own computer your own individual lottery. It's a micro lottery dedicated to you, only to you. Think of it like a slot machine whose lever you can pull down only once. You pull down the lever, and if you win, you get a winning ticket, namely a mathematical proof, easy to verify that you have won the order and you are a member of this committee, okay? And so, and if you win, you propagate, here is my winning ticket, listen to my opinion, and here is my opinion about the block, right? Roughly, that's, that's the idea. If you don't win, you're welcome to say anything, whatever you want, but without a winning ticket, your opinion is disregarded, okay? Wait for your turn when you are really a member of the next committee, okay? That's, that's the idea. Okay. So is this clear enough? 
So by the way, they, this lottery is a cryptographically fair lottery. What does this mean? That not even a nation state with huge computational resources could improve even minimally the chance of winning a lottery, of become, you becoming a member of the committee. Okay, so let me actually argue that this is really decentralized. Why is this decentralized? Because I'm not saying that a thousand people select the blocks, next block, for the, this month, or for the next week, or for the next day, or for an hour. But rather, one block, a thousand people committee, next block, a different one thousand people random selected committee, right? But more decentralized than this, it cannot be. And it's really decentralized at the token level because you select a thousand tokens and the committee members are the owners of these tokens. If two of your tokens are selected, you have two votes in the committee. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, decentralized, check. How about being scalable? Well, how long does it take you or me or anybody else to operate the lottery? A microsecond. Ooh, this is small. And if you win, what do you have to do? Well, you propagate your winning ticket and uh, your opinion about the block, up or down. Does this scale? Are you kidding? Of course, a, a thousand short messages, two thousand because you say two things, right? That, that, that works, that scales. And by the way, there are billions of people or trillions of people, we'd get the Martians in our blockchain too, where, you know, everybody's welcome. You still need a thousand people, committee, no matter how many users there are, right? So that's really scales, so, okay. Now let me argue that it's very secure. Assume I am this big scary guy that I was telling you, that I have the magic power to corrupt instantaneously any 1,000 users I want in the world. Whom do I want to corrupt? The committee members, so that I have control over blocks. But I have a problem. I don't know who the committee members are, because who, are, who is in the committee? The winners of this lottery that you run inside your own computer, so I have no idea if you won the lottery, or uh, she won the lottery, or this lady in Shanghai won the lottery, or this guy in Paris, who, I don't know. However, as soon as you open your mouth and you say, here's my winning ticket, I'm a member of the committee, and here is my opinion about the block, now I know who these 1,000 people are because they spontaneously disclose themselves, I can corrupt them right away. However, whatever they had to say, they already said it. And, uh, and their messages are virally propagated over the network. And even though I'm very powerful, I do not have the power to put back into the bottle messages that are virally propagated over, over the network no more than the US government has the power to put back in the bottle a message virally propagated by WikiLeaks. Okay? So the system is secure because beforehand, I don't know whom I should corrupt. And ex post, it's too late to corrupt them. And if you look at this, and you hide a bunch of, uh, of other type of uh, higher order reasoning, that's essentially why the trilemma does not hold, right? Because, uh, but you have to do something a little bit you know, uh, unorthodox in order to bypass this, uh, this trilemma. Okay, you know what? I've been uh, talking here for 45 minutes. It's time to come to an old. And so far, what I've done, I described to you the core technology of Algorand, which consists of this cryptographic sortition, so this people self-select themselves. As this Byzantine agreement is super duper fast, we didn't discuss that, but you believe me, why, I don't know. <laughs> and the other one is that at least you have an idea why it doesn't fork, right? Because we actually agree on every block. So that's the core technology. Check, what is next? Then, uh, actually, next is really next, because it's going to come next month, is the layer one technology. And let me tell you what does it mean. That means that, you know, so far, this technology, you create blocks and you handle transaction payments. But now you want to do something a little bit more sophisticated. You want to generate assets. Say, I want to generate my own tokens in Algon. Can I? Yes. That's what it means. Anybody can use uh, his or her own tokens at layer one. What does it mean, a layer one? At the consensus level, without getting to smart contracts, uh, if you know, those of if you know what that means. And we are going to have uh, all kinds of actually smart contracts 
but very, very simple that we can do in layer one. And by the way, these uh, layer one algorithm, the layer one smart contracts are sufficient to handle most of the needs for which people need the smart contracts. Who says this? Well, I do. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So let me focus on this because there is not enough time to describe you know, how to you issue assets on the algorithm blockchain. So let's look at these uh, layer one smart contracts. And there are two types, atomic transfer and till scripts. We'll figure out good names, OK? So now, good enough for today. Atomic transfer, actually, is, I think is a good name. So what are these? These are grouped transaction for simultaneous execution. And what are till scripts? These are custom writable layer one contracts using a very simple language. But never mind. We have the time only for one. What is the simpler to describe? Atomic transfers. OK, atomic transfer. Atomic swap is even simpler than atomic transfer, because a swap involves only two people. OK? And uh, in fact, here are the two people. User 1 has an asset x that user 2 wants, and user 2 has an asset y that user 1 wants. We want to exchange Shafi and I our assets. And they are on the blockchain? Well, not yet. Let's assume they are digital in the blockchain. So how do we do in, in the, quote, real world? How have we been doing this for thousands and thousands of years? By having a trusted mediator. Call it a bank, call it an escrow agent, call it you know, whatever. So we ask Jing, whom we both trust. I give my asset to Jing. Shavi gives her asset to Jing. Jing holds the two assets. Thank you very much. Now I'm the owner, but don't worry, because I'm trusted. Here is I give you back the assets right away, right? OK. Why not? Well, first of all, because it's laws of the transaction. Second of all, because Jing says, do you mind, you know, here is my bill for services rendered. <laughs> she wants to be paid. Can you believe it? Well, that's how the world works. That's why bank makes money, right? So that's all the meter. Turns out that 6% of the global GDP is lost in financial friction. That's a lot of growth. And I don't see, at the particular, in, uh, in already evolved uh, economies <laughs> where when you find this growth of GDP. Well, if you get rid of financial creation, you have a 6% at your disposal to invest in healthcare or whatever you want. What's that number again? 6%. 6%. 6%. Is uh, some McKinsey, you know, I don't think, at this point I forgot, so you have to document these things. Some, some uh, better thinker than I figure out what this number is. OK, we don't want this. They are too expensive. And by the way, they are also centralized because, right, these mediators, now they want to, they want to exchange assets too. By, by, by help by whom? By another mediator. But the mediator, if you don't does not give you the asset, you're going to sue the hell out of him or her. Therefore, he has to be bigger than you are, so that you have assets against which you can recover your losses. Okay? So then, therefore, this mediator gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as you know, there are essentially six banks in the world which, which have you know, super banks and so on and so forth. That's not the way to go, in my opinion at least. So forget that. How about smart contracts? Well, smart contracts, we don't have the time to describe them, but they are a wonderful idea of uh, blockchains. But they have the following problem. They are expensive, they are slow, and they are actually hard to design properly. So no day passes by that somebody loses a million dollars or two to a badly designed smart contract. So when you take your asset, and you give it to the smart contract, you start praying that you know, the smart contract really works, because you never see if this you see the asset back. Okay? So thanks, but no thanks, even if the work were very slow and things. How about hash time locks? So much people are suspicious and want to avoid the smart contract that they invented this other contraption that is very easy to explain, at least visually, without never mind whatever this means technically. Means the following. I go first. Why I go first? Because the atomic swap, it ain't atomic. Okay? So it is a multi-step swap. Atomic in English, okay, in name only. So I go first and I put on the blockchain the digital sign. I transfer my asset to Shafi temporarily. What does this mean? That I give Shafi an hour to post 
on the blockchain where she gives him my asset, and if she does so, the transaction is complete. Mine, mine. Y your asset. But if I posted and tick, 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 tock, tick, tock, she doesn't do it, I guess they're very nervous, so all of a sudden I post another transaction, an abort transaction, say, let's stop this way, this asset was only temporarily shafty, now it goes back home, okay? How about that? What's wrong with that? Well, first of all, it takes an hour. We want to do it in seconds. Okay, that's some value there. But second of all, Shafi must be able to post a board if I don't give the asset of Shigani. Thank you, Shafi, for uh, your house. So thank you very much. Now my money is coming, but you know, uh, it's, it's not coming. She can prevent me from posting an abort transaction how? by bombarding me of nonsense messages, so-called denial of service attack, from all kinds of services. So when I'm inundated, my communication lines of these junk messages, I cannot receive any more messages, nor can I post any other message. So an hour in the case of a house is not good enough. In fact, people in the literature recommend a day. Some people recommend two days, and guess what? There are people who recommend three days. And if you want to be mathematical about it, <laughs> it depends on what the value of the asset is. So you want to com continue to have the rules so that, they, so that the denial of service attack becomes so expensive that at some point you must stop it and let me post my bot transaction. And therefore, everything is extremely slow. So thanks, but no thanks. What do we do instead? We do it by a single transaction. I decided not to have slides because I got lazy. Okay. So I'll do it by hands, okay? It's conceptually, what I want to say is the following. Assume that there are the blocks that I now produce are one, two, three, four, a hundred. Right? Now I'm going to sign the following. I, Silvio, transfer my million dollar to Shafi if the signature of mine, and Shafi transferring to me a house, together appear in block 101. Okay? Okay. When I propagate to the network this, my signature, do I worry if Shafi is reciprocating and propagating her own thing? No. Why? Because a few seconds later, I look in the sky and block 101 has appeared. Case one, my signature and Shafi's signature are both there, great. She has my million dollars, I have a house. If my signature is there, but not Shafi's, well, the million dollars are not hers at all, because the rules were stated in this way, right? And vice versa. So in other words, that is, uh, assume that somebody bombards me under the denial of service attack, I cannot post my signature. So what? Shafi doesn't lose anything, and I don't lose anything. Each one of us keeps their assets. If instead we manage to post this conceptually single transaction, then we are asset is transferred. Okay, so what are the advantages that in a single transaction we have X and Y? Bing, either this happens or we keep our assets. The advantage of a single transaction is, of course, nobody can cheat. Because I can cheat if I go first and somebody has to go second, then I go third, right? But if there is a single transaction, if this transaction enters the blockchain, we are done and otherwise done. And then it happens in layer one, which means it takes 4.5 seconds as much you get in the block, and it's done at the same security level than, uh, than the consensus, which is the highest security level. And then, by the way, there are no errors possible because you don't have to, because it's done uh, at a layer one. And in my opinion, that is what the trading ought to be. We've disintermediated. That is a big advantage of a blockchain. If you think about it, this blockchain that looks a static object, a bunch of blocks, boring, boring, a second block, third block, oh, okay, nobody can change it. But look at the power. The fact if I have a guarantee based on the majority of honesty of all the money, that blocks appear uh, with a certain rhythm, right? I can talk about I do this if there's only a shafi appears in the same block. It gives me a language to express all this disintermediation transaction. And that's where, in my opinion, the real power of a blockchain is. Because you are making, you are capable of generating trust 
even assuming that Shafi and I never met before, we, we really can uh, transact with a real trust as if we were between friends, right? That's his idea. All right, and by the way, not to make sure that, you know, uh, that it's only atomic swaps, you can actually have, uh, for instance, uh, very often in a, in a supply chain, you want to say, I want this payment and this payment and this payment in this currency, in this other currency, in yuan, uh, in uh, euros, in, in dollars, right? because when you transport, what's an example? Everybody puts anything in the blockchain, coffee. Somebody must be paid because grew the, the coffee beans. Somebody must be paid because it brings the coffee beans from the Andes to the plane. Somebody must be paid because it puts them on a train. Somebody must, uh, in the harbor, puts it on a ship. The ship goes to Singapore, whatever it happens. You know, everybody must be paid. You know, right now, with our financial network, how long this takes? Three months. Because all these ledgers must be in agreement. Instead, if you do it this way, one, two, three, done. 4.5 seconds. You're Exchange. Again, every payment is individually sent. I don't know if everybody else is doing the same thing or not, but I'm sure that you know, I, I pay nobody unless I get paid too. And if there are multiple players. And the advantage are the same. Single transaction. Single transaction means no cheating. Layer one means fast and no error possible, no smart contracts. And a little bit of what we, we, our strategy is to do at layer one in this similar fashion as much as possible. And all kinds of smart contracts expressed in a very simple language, which consists of a, a straight line program of 30 operations, like add, compare, hash, verify a digital signature, right? These are four over 30. It turns out you can do a lot of things. You can do not only a swap, but post and sale. I can post, say, my house for sale, and I go for vacation. At the end, I come, I come and see even somebody has bought at the price I declared or not, or the house I still is mine. But you can do all kinds of uh, very rich things. And by the way, all these things are really important for having friction finance. And because we have no more time for uh, other things, let me bypass everything, and, and we just tell you a little bit of time. The Algorand, thanks to the effort of the team, uh, got live uh, and uh, generating uh, blocks after blocks. Uh, we already uh, more than a billion blocks ever since uh, last June. This November, we are going to have all these uh, atomic swaps, um, uh, layer one smart contracts, etc. And what is next? It comes all kinds of things which comes to the next year. Um, um, Core chains, virtual chains, whatever that means. We have no time for that. And by the way, we have plans to keep on going, okay? Stay tuned for whatever else is coming on the Algorand blockchain. So let me conclude. I was saying aspiration and technology. What is my take? My take is that technology is quintessentially human. All this notion that technology is, uh, I mean, humans create their own tools and technology just do this square cube, right? It's a question of degrees. So I, and I believe that technology is here to serve humans. And now actually, I go a step farther and I believe that only true technology will let us be who we really want to be. Thank you. On time. Ah, unbelievable. So now we're going to open the floor for questions. Yeah, I'll pass the mic around. Uh, can you tell us, uh, like, this uh, thing, that, what's a vault? Mm. Vault. Um, okay. Vault. Okay. Vault is under smart chain technology. Okay. So. Once you solve a problem, this blockchain has this beauty that is like this hydra with many heads. You squash a head and another head comes up. Before, the bottleneck was computation to solve a riddle, right? Then, okay, you solve that now, computation is in essentially to create this very fast Byzantine agreement, blah, 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 blah. You have done it. Now what happens? You are, you can, you are a victim of your own success. You start generating blocks every few seconds, you know, after a year or two, you have a terabyte of data. And somebody says, then what becomes hard is storage, or actually even handling, and giving to somebody else this data. 
So you might as well say, oh, gee, I'm, I'm now convinced of Algorand three years ago. I could have started, but I know. Can I join? Of course you can join. Everybody's welcome in Algorand. So what do you have to do? I want to participate to the generation of a block. Of course you should. That's why we will lower the level of participation, computational level of participation. Your laptop can is plenty to compute it. OK, what do I need? Oh, download the terabyte, and you're ready to go. So downloading a terabyte uh, isn't easy. Right? So you have <laughs> It takes you three months. And after three months, you have to wait a little bit more because in these three months, you add a few more blocks to the chain. So that becomes now the next uh, bottleneck. And um, so you're a victim of your own success. So what the Vault does, essentially, it allows to onboard new users who can participate to the consensus protocol, to the generation of a block, absolutely unequal, um, unequal, uh, uh, um, uh, Playing field. Playing field. <laughs> My English, when I don't sleep, it gets, uh, I go back to Italian or worse. <laughs> it's um, a baby language. So uh, it's a level of influence with the people who have been there from the very beginning. So what, what happens? You join, we'll give you a, a compact piece of information that you can verify the correctness. Because if I give it to you or a friend gives it to you, you don't trust anybody, you can verify that this piece of information is correct. And with this piece of information, you can somehow grow the chain forward, keeping this piece of information compact. In other words, after three years, it's not that you need, you are actually to store a terabyte either. You modify this compact piece of information all along, and you can generate new blocks. Like me, I was an, an algorithm on day one from the very beginning. No difference. I said, gee, but there ought to be a difference. Yes, the only difference is that the people who were there from the very beginning and are storing all this tetrabyte, they are the only one who can answer archival questions, such as, what was the third transaction in block number two or three years ago? Well, if you're not there in your compact piece of information, when you get onboarded, you cannot figure this out. But the people who have it, they also, we give them the technology, given that you have it, you can convince somebody by giving, again, a compact piece of information who proves the, the, the piece that you wanted to retrieve from, from, uh, from archive is really correct. Roughly, that is the idea. Um, Silvio, uh, you had this example towards the end of your talk about Shafi selling you the house for a million dollars. So what prevents Shafi from selling a house to two different people? OK, that is, um, that is um, very correct. So, <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> because I was elliptic in my description. Um, so remember what I was saying in this conditional uh, language? I'm going to say, I, seal you, sell the stuff. I'm going to say to Shafi, and then uh, and if and only if Shafi does this. And so now remember that what a layer one, you have to instruct all the verifiers that there is a new sheriff in town, a new transaction in town. It's not only a payment, but any time that uh, I, I define the asset that I given to Shafi. In the same block, it cannot be that I give the same asset to somebody else. So, right? so a block that contains my giving asset to Shafi and I give an asset to you is invalid. But you might want to wait for a few blocks to make sure she doesn't. Okay, but remember, once however the transfer is done, um, one of the good things that um, um, we have in Algorand in particular, maybe, maybe others have it too, but certainly is a good thing, is that you keep track not only of the amount of money that a public key has, but also the assets that each public key has. So once I, if I had Shafi at the house, I have a million dollars. If Shafi now wants to, a few blocks later, sell her own house, uh, no verifier is going to believe her because this house is, uh, in, uh, in, is under Silvio's key now, belongs to Silvio. Right? That's, that's roughly the idea. Uh, a question here. I take it chains become enormously long. Is the question of efficient search something of practical question? V that is uh, correct. So if you, are, uh, if you want to search for a transaction that uh, you don't know where it is, it becomes, a it becomes a very hard. So if, uh, if somebody wants to answer a archival question is prepared uh, in, a, in a particular database, in a particular data structure to, to retrieve it, 
So, but if I'm not one of these people and, uh, and I arrive you know, ex novo and I look at the stuff, I don't know where it is. In fact, actually, you ask a, a very good question because we have a different technology to handle this, which is uh, somehow, uh, we call it a self-verifiable transaction. At least whenever anything relates to you, you have the ability by looking at the chain, but not storing it, to prove that anybody, anybody else, whenever you want, in a very compact way, anything you want, you own. Assets or money, houses, horses, whatever. Sailboats. So, of course, that is, is in your interest to keep this information around because you want to, to exchange with somebody else. Then it becomes very easy to say, do you want to buy my house? And by the way, here is a proof that never mind that the blockchain has been operating for 10 years, this house is, is mine. Because otherwise you're right. Because somebody else will say, oh, thank you. Yes, I'll be interested in this house. It looks very good. Let me check if you really own it. Then I have to go from the beginning of the blockchain and comb every single block and say, oh, the house comes in the blockchain of this block uh, year number three. That's good. Oh, a few years later, oh, Dana now has the, the, the house. That's very good. And then, however, let me continue checking because I want to check that Dana has not sold it elsewhere. So it is a hybrid. Is a... If you want to search it, you have to create your own data structure, but uh, at least the owners of the assets, we give them you know, a ready-made uh, uh, way to prove uh, ownership. Uh, even if it's uh, highly unlikely, do you have a uh, strategy for pruning a fork? Yes, uh, but believe it or not, we have not uh, put it in, in, the, in the code right now. Yeah. Um. So it sounds like um, one's power to influence the consensus in this system is proportional to the tokens you have, or like that's how it's assigned, whereas in proof of work systems, it's obviously by power to hash whatever function they've defined as the hash function. Um, is there, um, like, do you believe there's a reason that since you claim this is more decentralized, why, um, or like how, the system will prevent ownership of these tokens from somehow becoming centralized or at least like more centralized than you would want it to be? Well, so let, let's remember one thing. So first of all, the system is decentralized in the sense that every token has the same power. Mm -hmm. So if I don't have any token, why should I have any power in a blockchain or any token? But the same token, <laughs> if you own 10 times as many tokens as I have, you have a little bit more interest but to make sure that the system works correctly. So you are going to have a 10 times more probability to participate in the consensus that I have, right? But I think that is only right that is so. By the way, should it be the, uh, there is a difference between uh, owning and having central power um, in, the, in the same way, in the following sense. Let's assume that I own 90% of the tokens, okay? And then at that point, you can be guaranteed that I'm going to be honest. Because if I start being dishonest, right, and I want to buy, a, I don't know, a sofa, Doug uh, as a furniture store, say, oh, I like the sofa. He said, do you mind if I pay you an Algorand? Well, I'm sorry, I think, you know, a lot of um, fraud has been happening. I don't want to. So I devalue my own money. So remember, the mining power is a bit different. Why is it a bit different? Because the miners have all the power and no money, relatively speaking. Right? So there is the whole economy, they own a very little piece of it. It's a different story if, uh, if I own 90% of an economy, let me sure that, you know, the last thing I want to do. By the way, by doing this, I can vote blocks, propose blocks more often, but I can never suck your money into me. Mm -hmm. Because this money transfer is operates only via a digital signature of yours that I cannot fake. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mike. Yes, thank you. A um, couple of questions. So first of all, if it's really, really successful and you have all this data you've got to store, you can't have it stored in any one particular location. You kind of need a distributed storage solution, correct? So have you thought about that? No. <laughs> it's one step at a time. Another Hydra head somewhere else. I'll tell you, that would be a nice problem to solve. Yes, sure. but you're right. So, yeah, if, uh, if humanity as a whole wants to take this, then you must uh, 
find a different way to represent all, all, all the stuff. Or you start uh, saying, well, you know what, archival questions uh, that go back 3,000 years, we no longer <laughs> care about to keep them. Well, that was my second question. Is there a way to kind of get rid of stuff? Because at some point, you're just going to have too much stuff, and someone's going to be irrelevant, so you want to get rid of it somehow. Well, as I said, that in some sense, the stuff is always there, but uh, they, whatever, you have a superstructure, which is this compact piece of information, that is the one that you care to go forward. Right? So at any point in time, it is, not, it is very clear who owns what, whether money or asset, and how to grow the chain. And then the rest is for uh, historians who may be interested in it, and then after 3,000 years, who bought a chair from whom, uh, it becomes less relevant. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, all these are, are good ideas, but, uh, but we had to figure out uh, for what reasons. If you want to summarize the chain for the purpose of growing the chain forward, then we don't need to summarize it. Or in some sense, this compact piece of information, you can call it a summarization of the chain. So I call it a compact piece of information that allows you to grow the chain forward, but you can actually view it in your language as a summarization, yes. But, or uh, you can actually do... You can do all kinds of things. Say, uh, I want to periodically, every 100 years, I want to have at least a snapshot of one's what to help historians later on. Sure, but you can do it too. And by the way, and, uh, you don't need uh, somehow, using this vault, you can actually do this uh, quite efficiently. Because once you start storing a piece of a chain, and then nothing, and then another piece, uh, you have to be careful because, you know, how do you know that this piece is correct? So, you, what, what we do is that we have, a, we have a proof of correctness of every single piece, and this proof of correctness in Vault is anchored to, guess what, the Genesis block, which is the only block on which there is certainty. Uh, I think it was in 87 you had written with your collaborators that all games with honest majority can be efficiently played. Uh, that assumes a static corruption model for the... No, it was of... dynamic, but he assumed something which, you know, I never realized uh, before it was a limitation, that the number of players was known in advance. So this uh, multi-party computation, uh, 1987, uh, yes, uh, at 88 without our cryptography, with, uh, with Shafi, 87, um, me and company, Shafi and company, without the cryptography, they were games in which uh, you say, the players are A, B, C, D, yet to know that. And so these are a different uh, story because uh, you don't even know what the players are. And by the way, another thing that uh, is a little bit you know, bizarre, and um, this never happened uh, uh, to me, in this, this protocol, Byzantine protocol, that I'm hiding as much as I can because it's, uh, it's, it's hard to explain in an hour, as a one property that I never dreamed of, which is a player replaceability. Let me tell you what the player replaceability is. <laughs> means the, the following, that, uh, that the protocol works even if, say, a thousand people get up and speak, okay? And then a totally different 1,000 people get up and speak, and then a totally different 1,000 people get up and, and speak, okay? With no connection with each other. Not, you, you don't exchange variables. You don't uh, uh, share state in a stateless manner, okay? So okay, what kind of, what is a protocol? It's an intelligent conversation. What kind of intelligent conversation can you possibly have when the people get up and say something, and then some unrelated people say something else with no connection, not having shared everything. It seems impossible. Well, there are a few things that you can do. That, for instance, if a thousand people get up and each one of them shouts a, num a random number between one and a thousand, and then the next thousand people get up and shouts a number between one and a thousand, and so on and so forth, it is the same as if the same set of 1,000 people each time shouts a random number between one and a thousand. 
But what are they doing? Nothing. We are charging number, random numbers. So this stuff it can be done in a player replaceable way or can be done by the same people. Strange thing is that there are actually a class of protocols that actually are player replaceable, and guess what is player replaceable? It's Byzantine agreement. And that, to me, was so surprising that you know, I never, in 40 years of work with uh, Shafi, I never thought about even defining this, uh, this type of thing. What was it surprising? No, no <laughs> player replaceability, which means that you, know, you don't need the same players. The, uh, so the protocol is played by some players and then by some other player totally unrelated and without any prior agreement or without sharing information. The one thing that I can do, I can describe, is uh, the, the following. First of all, um, think about uh, um, a war movie. Hopefully it's a movie rather than a reality, even though it has been a reality. So, right? so when you want to bring the flag you know, from your side to the enemy side, if you do, you win. That's the game, okay? And then what happens, uh, if you see in the movie, the movies, because they do the same scene over and over again, you start carrying the flag, then whoever carries the flag, right, gets killed, and when it's about to kill, somebody else catches the flag and continues. Do you care who actually carries the flag at the end? No, you only care that the flag is carried on the other hand. So in some sense, this happens also in this type of class of protocols. There are, strangely enough, a few things that you can do in a player replaceable way. So the world's financial system as of, say, 2000, um, which is this sort of ad hoc mixture of cash and bank accounts, had a couple of features, right? One is that small-ish transactions can be conducted with a degree of privacy and anonymity. That's pretty good. Uh, and another is that large transactions, uh, and even medium-sized ones, governments can step in and, say, freeze assets, whether it's because somebody hasn't been paying their child support or because somebody's a terrorist. Uh, these are both sort of broadly desirable features to have, and I'm wondering in what way they can be realized sort of in this schema. Okay, so first of all, um, when you say they are uh, desirable features, like in anything else in life, they are desirable in one scenario and non-desirable in another scenario. Because if I am uh, in a dictatorship, and all of a sudden the dictator doesn't like me anymore because I looked at, at, at him or her sideways, I am lucky if I run with my life in a pajama and my assets are frozen, right? So if in, in a blockchain, pun? Well, you know, when you want to run, uh, <laughs> when you want to run and you don't have time to pack things, right? So, so and it says, uh, I leave behind the house, I leave behind the money, my bank account is frozen, uh, right? I mean, so, I mean, we are very fortunate uh, in, in our uh, uh, country to think that uh, the ability of freezing somebody's assets is a good thing because it helps uh, law enforcement and things. And, and, you know, in some other countries, we, we are very, very lucky. Well, I can, I can, in the world we live in, right? Like, well, no, no, okay, okay, okay. But second of all, I want to say... Like whether this is desirable. Like no, 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 okay, okay, okay. So certainly, <laughs> um, you cannot freeze assets. You can decide to run uh, Algorand on a country level, meaning that you decide uh, your monetary policy, you can decide to inflate or deflate or whatever you want to do, but you enable your countrymen to transact without mediators. So you save the 6% of your own GDP. That is good. But freezing the assets you cannot do. That's a problem, right? Well, again, uh, it is a problem or uh, is, is not a, or, 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 or not. So, so what I want to say, uh, right, so I'm, 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 I'm saying, if we do live uh, in, a, in a superstructure that uh, there is a course and things, if I don't play alimony, or child support, then they get me in some other way. But the notion that they had to get me by freezing the assets, that is a, a historical fact that actually happens because of the way money is handled right now, but it's not to be something sacrosanct that has to be written anywhere. So I'm, by the way, for law enforcement, right? Uh, by all means, but what I'm saying, why should I arrive via money? Is, is, uh, right? So law enforcement is okay, we need the law enforcement. 
but not necessarily that the way to express itself has to be uh, via freezing somebody's assets. The other half, privacy and anonymity. Okay, privacy and anonymity. And uh, first of all, uh, as uh, cryptographers, uh, <laughs> um, we love uh, privacy, right? And uh, here I'm describing the system with a vanilla privacy of uh, the pseudo anonymity of, uh, of the key. So uh, I just have one key, rather than keeping all my money in one key, I create some new key, I transfer some of the money, nobody knows that these other 10 keys are mine, and maybe I want to be a bit more private. So that is a va vanilla thing. If you want to want to do add privacy, you can, but, uh, but you need a totally different type of technology. So, um, here at Berkeley is uh, Alessandro here. Oh, calling. So he's uh, the co-founder of Zcash, which is uh, really a lot of beautiful mathematics. It goes into making sure that the, the, the blockchain is really private, not pseudo-private, but really private. And to say, you know, right now, I. I'm unsure about doing it because, by the way, I care about law enforcement. So you don't want to be the crypto system or money launderers either, right? So, right. so and, and until we figure that out, I'll be very hesitant. So I'm sure that it should happen. I can put all the price in the world and then I'm ready to give the master key to the government if necessary. But then, you know, it's a bit more complicated. I, I, I feel that, you know, I want to get there later when I, I'm satisfied with the solution of the list now. Yes. Uh, so my question is more on the Byzantine agreement. So according to the slides, I might be wrong. You start off with only the Genesis block, one block. So and yes. the addition of next block actually depends on the Byzantine agreement. So the probability of having a 51% attack in that case is more, right? How do you mitigate that? What if my next block, it keeps on adding malicious nodes? or blocks, how do you mitigate that? Um, remember, you don't add nodes. So, so there are keys. Nodes are for transmission of your uh, ge uh, geographically location servers or whatever. It's not nodes. It's, um, there are keys who own money, right? Okay, and so um, and then what happens is that uh, you, you sample a thousand tokens again, okay? And the owners of these thousand tokens are the committee. Okay, so, so then you have to play a little bit with uh, the math. So if you assume that you have a 90% uh, honest thing, you want to make sure that you select a thousand tokens, or if it's not a thousand, it's two thousand, so make sure that you have a two-thirds honest majority in your thousand or two thousand, right? That, that, that is the idea. So then, then you must make sure that for every single block, you must sure that this probability is very, very low. I said the 10 to the minus 18. So, so if you keep on insisting, eventually you'll find a, a committee with a dishonest majority or with a majority is uh, more than it should be. So who are the participants when you have just one block, only the Genesis block, and you are agreeing on something, so there is only one participant right now. So how do you manage that then? Okay, so but remember that... Uh, the assumption, so no theorem follows without assumption. We need assumptions, axioms, if you want, and rules of inference. Right. So the axiom here is that at any point in time, the majority of the money is in honest hands. If as a genesis block, I only have the money, by assumption, I'm honest. Right? Okay. 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 Right? So, by the way, then I can actually explain what's in English. Is my interest, as I was saying before, to be honest, because if I'm dishonest, I devalue the very money that I own, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm saying, by mathematically, you know, honest majority means if there are uh, a million people and each one has the same amount of money, then uh, if there's 90% of these people are, uh, 900,000 of these people, I say a million, 900,000 are, uh, are honest. If, uh, if there is uh, 12 people and one has a disproportionate amount of money, maybe the first two are honest and would satisfy, or these other five or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. So uh, you mentioned how every token has an equal. Oh, uh, hey, Joe, yeah. how are you? <laughs> Great, so 
You mentioned how uh, you know you think it's an essential part of proof of stake that every token has an equal vote, but you also want to issue assets, right? That will represent different things. So I guess how do you think about proof of stake security when there's all these different assets floating around on the same chain that might have different values and might represent different things? Very acute observation. I haven't thought about it yet. <laughs> I think that it's going to be maybe a necessary step, maybe not, but somehow. The whole, uh, uh, the whole system is, uh, is uh, hinged on the fact that uh, on the token themselves. And uh, perhaps you, know, you may want to change the model to say, well, now assets have uh, a reason to be voted to. And, uh, and that may be may, may, is a different model, and I, 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 don't, I don't know how to um, or, or, or orchestrated this, but you, you are right. In principle, we want to say, I want to also with other, with other uh, I want to count assets. But why is it hard? Because it's hard to, because now you have uh, assess the value of these assets. And I can think of a, a bunch of ways to do so, and, uh, but uh, right now, uh, do I want to stick my neck and to say, oh, they're so good, this way you assess it. I'm saying, you know, one day I think I have a model for handle this, another day the model switches, <laughs> and I, I'm really not sure what the, the right model is, but it's a very good point. Um, I was wondering, uh, what happens to tokens that don't participate in the, in the protocol, like if my laptop is like turned off or something? Um, uh, yes, you can do it. So the way we, um, um, we do practically in Algorand is that uh, we give you a, a chance when... Uh, to register yourself as a participating or not participating. Mm -hmm. And if you are not participating, meaning you know, disregard from the count uh, of, uh, of the total stake, my coins, because I only want to transact, but I don't want to participate to the consensus. And then that's, that's where you do it. And, uh, yeah. no, I was wondering, for those who particip participate, are the messages broadcast to the whole network? Every single uh, message for the consensus protocol? Okay, so then uh, there is, um, in the original design, uh, um, so we, we had this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, um, uh, broadcasting, right? And then until uh, we figure out a way to do Algorand in a way that is uh, partition resilient, okay, the protocol, which is another pro property that I didn't even discuss. And essentially at high level, so if you want, I can dive into this a bit more, but uh, maybe somebody else wants to have another question, or we can do it offline. What does partition resilient mean? It means that it's secure against network attacks. Okay. So if it is secure against network attacks, by the way, Bitcoin is not secure against network attacks, which uh, for some reason not everybody mentions it every single time, but uh, it should be mentioned because uh, right, people think of it, if the miners, uh, there is an honest majority of the mining power, then Bitcoin is secure. But it's not, not at all true. Even all miners can be all honest, and Bitcoin is not secure. Why? Because let's assume that the miners are equally distributed on the planet, and somehow I disconnect South America, one of the five populated continents. Why do I use five? Because I can reason better with five and six, I forget Antarctica, okay? I disconnect some. Okay, so then, then what happens? That uh, somehow the chain in South America continues, but uh, with speed one five, right, in Bitcoin, and the other chain, the rest of the world, continues with speed of four, four out of five, right? So we speed the four and we speed the one. So if I disconnect for a while, I create a fork, I can double spend in South America, and then when uh, law and order is restored, the cables, whatever uh, has, has happened to the network, the routers have been reconfigured correctly, then everybody sees that uh, the chain was uh, on, the, on the longer side, and the, even the South America migrate to mine over that. So what does it mean? That if somebody attacks the network, all the miners are honest. All the South American miners uh, were doing a fine job. The miners in the rest of the world are all honest. But by simply disconnecting the network, I can double spend in South America. Okay, so that is something that the network is, an attack of the network is lethal to Bitcoin, and I claim it's not lethal in, in Algorand. And I'm going to give you a, a, a very vague proof. 
you need a certain threshold, say, of 700 of a, of a fuzzant signature to mint a block in Algorand, right? So people agree, I output, right? Uh, this block is signed by me and 700 people. So that's it, of a fuzzant people committee. Then, if you attack the network, so to speak, at least this particular attack fails because either in no part of the world after the network is partitioned, you have 700 signatures of the same block, or you have it, you know, in the, in the four continents and not in South America. So what happens is you never have a fork. So at most, you suspend the production of blocks, which, by the way, is okay, because in a distributed system, if an adversary cuts all wires to me, to you, and we are in a Faraday cage, can we produce blocks? No. But what we want is that if we suspend the blocks for a while, we want to, when we restart uh, connectivity, nobody loses money. That's what we want. And in Algorand, that is the case. In Bitcoin, it's not. Okay. Long story short to say, we are resilient to network partition and network attacks. What is the big advantage? That somehow we can use untrusted servers to act as a relay to change the messages. You make a rules that you want to be a relay node, you can welcome. You are a relay node too. So there is a list of relay nodes, and anybody is welcome, and I don't have to trust them, right? Because worse comes to worse, then the block is, is uh, uh, generation is stopped, but nobody loses money. And because of that, I think that you are better off at this point to tell something to a, a relay node, and then the relay node uh, expands it, and it's much more much a better way of, much faster way of communicate, but it should only be used if your blockchain is partition resilient. If it's, if it's not partition resilient, you should never get there. So that's another uh, an aspect of the security that you can actually spend it in efficiency. You have mentioned about this uh, compacted database to keep the database manageable for transactions going forward. Can this compacted database be a hash, a long hash of the previous? No, it has to be something more complicated than that, because uh, once you have, if you hash something together in order to continue uh, to unhash all kinds of things, yeah, it has to be orchestrated a little bit uh, more. Yeah, some hashing is involved, but it cannot be just a, um, a hash. You know what? I'm tempted to quit when I'm ahead because so far I've answered. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So much. Thank you.